Hey, have you ever asked yourself, how can I make my investments more efficient? How can I make my use of money more efficient? How can I make myself more efficient? That's what we're going to talk about with Paul Miners today on our show. And I hope you are ready to take a note or take a listen and find out how you can increase efficiency in anything you do with Paul Miners' advice. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Ideal Investor Show. Today we have a great guest from pretty far away where they hang upside down. This is Paul Miners from New Zealand is with us. Hey, Paul, how are you doing? Hey, Axel, I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely. So I know that you are an efficiency master, so to speak, an expert. And I would like to ask you real quick to remind, I mean, this is not the first time, but remind the audience real quick what you do, how you do it, what you're focusing on. Yeah, I run a consulting business, which I started on my own. I was a solo operator for many years. Uh, now I have a team around me. But what we do is we specialize in a few bits of software. So Asana, which is a project management tool, maybe your audience have heard of. Pipedrive, which is a sales CRM. And Zapier, which is an automation tool. Um, so we specialize in these bits of software. What we do is we provide support. So when a customer is new to Asana or Pipedrive, we provide support helping them to set it up correctly. We train their team on how to use it properly. We'll often do automation, connecting people's tools and technology together so we can streamline their business. That's ultimately what we do is we help businesses to run more efficiently. And so in the context of your show and investing, I very much look at my business as obviously a way of generating cash. And uh, from Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is one of my favorite investor books, my business is a way of earning, it's called earned income. I'm earning that income. Right. But then what I do with that is I want to put that into productive income producing assets. So I mentioned at the start, we're actually selling a rental property now because we're building our dream home, but we have had a rental for the last couple of years. And I invest in things like Bitcoin, which I know we'll talk about because I'm really interested in how do I take the earnings and the profit from my business and get that working for me to produce passive income or portfolio income, which is what he talks about in the book. I kind of like, yeah, that's how I look at my business is it's a way of generating cash to then invest into other things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's very important, whether you're a business owner like you who generates cash or profits to invest, or if somebody is earning income in the traditional sense of having a job and then take a certain part of that earned income and invest it. So you, like you said, you mentioned that you're selling a rental And people will say, wow, Axel, that's really weird. Why do you bring somebody on, bless you, who is selling a rental? Because you always say, don't ever sell any real estate you were lucky enough to buy. So tell us a little bit about what's that rental? How has it performed? And what made you make the decision to sell it? Yeah, good question. So we bought the rental in 2015, I believe it was, early 2015. So we've held it for over seven years now. Yeah. We actually lived in it for a short period. We, My wife and I, when we were traveling, we're in our mid-20s, we did some travel. When we actually came back, we moved into the rental for a short period so that we could renovate it. So we put some money into it, improved the kitchen and the bathroom, and then we rented it out again. Uh, it's performed really well. In terms of New Zealand dollars, I think we bought it for about $594,000 in 2015. And we're selling it right now. In fact, this Friday, it's Thursday here today in New Zealand. You're on uh, Wednesday, yeah. I'm on Thursday. <laughs> Tomorrow, it okay. should go. We should get a deposit. We're going unconditional tomorrow. We're selling it for 905000 Okay, so it almost doubled, which is awesome appreciation. Now, a few things, because a lot of people that listen to us are American or US-based. One thing is what you just described, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with Bigger Pockets. The, one of the early people in Bigger Pockets, Brandon, guy with the beard, right? Like Brandon, who always said, okay, I call that the Burr method in a sense, where you buy something and you move into it yourself and then you renovate it. One thing I'm curious, and I'm sure our audience is a little bit curious about in New Zealand, is there a benefit or is it better if you are owner-occupied versus an investment property? From a tax point of view, it's better that it's a rental property because you can claim that against your income. Right, right. No, I mean, when um, you first get it, yeah, like here in the US, 
if I buy an investment property, typically I have to put 20, 25% down payment. If I buy yeah. something for myself, I can start out as low as yeah. like three and a half no, it's, or 5%. It's or so. Similar here. Yeah. You need less to buy a, a personal, a primary residence for your house. With a rental, the LVR requirements for an investor are higher. You need to put up more capital um, yeah. yourself. Yeah. But I was actually working as a mortgage advisor at the time. So it was good learning about the industry. So we were actually able to borrow against our primary residence, which I'm sure your yeah, listeners yeah. do all the time. We borrowed against our primary residence. So even though we had to put up, I think it was, I think we had to put up 20% of deposit at the time. It's now 40%. It's increased because the government is trying to cool the market. They're trying to bring prices down. So they yeah. require investors to put up 40%. But at the time, we could borrow all of that against our primary residence for our deposit. And then we get the remaining lending from a separate bank. So it was actually 100% debt financed. But no, the reason we moved into it was because we actually sold our primary residence before our trip. We did a six month trip and I was just starting my business at the time. And I didn't want to be carrying too much debt right. because I was starting my business. I just wanted to de-risk a little bit. I was brand new to business and didn't want to put myself in too risky a situation. So we sold our primary residence. And when we came home, we just thought, let's move into the rental for a short period. Then we can do it up, make it really nice and rent it out again. And then the reason we're selling it now is to finance our dream homes. We're actually buying a piece of land at the moment. We're going to be building a big family home. We could technically borrow everything to do that. We don't need to sell the rental. But again, for me, I kind of look at it sometimes as how much risk are you comfortable with? And I'm happy to take the profit on the rental and put that into the family home. I have other investments. So in order to just lower our total leverage and debt, that's why we're choosing to sell it at the moment to put the equity into our family home. Okay, that's... Um... Good explanation there. Thank you. One thing when we are talking in the Ideal Investor Show and at Ideal Wealth Grower with our community is exactly looking at the risk that you're describing. And one of the really core aspects of how high is that risk truly is revolving around two numbers or two factors, actually. One is how is the property performing from how much it costs me to pay for the financing and potentially property management and those kind of things, insurance and what have you, versus the rental income? So obviously, yeah. I mean, anybody who does this and wants to get the passive income or the portfolio that you mentioned wants to start out and we always recommend you should have at least some positive cash flow, even from day one that the rental or the lease agreement starts, or it becomes an investment property, so to speak. So that's one measure, obviously, which then drives in a sense towards the point of, okay, well, you're only going to be able to do that when number one, the property is seen as valuable by the potential tenants, and yeah. you have that property in an area where the tenants are for lack of a better term, dependent, right? Like if they sign an agreement, then they also live up to the commitment of making the monthly payment and so far. So assuming that is the case and you have positive cash flow, that would be one of the measures to say, okay, how risky is it actually? Because I think that's the risk that you're really looking at. And tell me if it's wrong, but I would look at and tell our community, okay, well, if you have a location where it's very likely that you consistently have well dependable tenants that pay their rent, yeah. then the risk of you having to be the one who has to pay the mortgage out of your pocket rather than out of the rent income is low. Yeah. Right. So that would be the one thing. The other thing is, you know, what is the opportunity of this particular investment property reasonable expectation, let's say for five years into the future. If you say, okay, I had it seven years and it doubled in value. Well, we have a more volatile market right now, pretty much worldwide. Yeah. If you had to look out another five or seven years or 10 years, is it potentially doubling again? Yeah. That would be one of the things where we would say, well, if there is a good potential, maybe not in the short term, but in the medium to long term, that it keeps increasing in value to rather do like what's called here in the United States, a home equity line of credit against yeah. the equity even though you probably only get 70 or 80% of the actual equity in the house, but that is a good chunk of money without having to sell it. So did you go through that kind of consideration? Yeah. yeah. I mean, looking at the cash flow of our rental, it was very slightly positive. You know, yeah. we're covering the interest, covering our insurance and everything, saving a little bit, you know, earning enough so that we can cover maintenance on the property and still make a little profit. But most of the return is coming from the appreciation of the price. Okay. And so 
part of the reason for selling as well is just looking at the economy right now, the environment that we're in. Obviously, the markets are down. We're probably going into a recession soon. So because we are building our family home in this somewhat uncertain environment, you know, looking ahead, we don't know what's going to happen with the economy. We don't know, is this going to be a big, deep recession that's going to run long? Or are we going to kind of bounce back out of it like we did in March 2020, COVID, you know? So there's a little bit of uncertainty there. I think if the economy was in a healthier position, I probably would have kept the rental property and still okay. done this. But I no, think but looking at everything, I was like, well, I need to factor in my business might decrease in revenue. You know, if the economy slows down a little bit, I have to factor in that we might earn a little bit less. And we are investing quite a lot, actually, in our family home. It's a very nice piece of land. It's a nice view. We're going <laughs> yeah, to build a, you. we're going to build a really nice house. <laughs> yeah. And I can finance that my earnings from my business. We can finance a big mortgage, but with a bit of that uncertainty in the economy right now, I just made the decision. Let's sell the rental. We've made a good profit over the last seven years and we can use that to pay down and have a bit smaller mortgage than we otherwise would. And we can get back in later. You know, we can buy another rental later, but right now, just while we're seeing a little bit of uncertainty in the market and what's going to happen in the near future, that was the decision I came to taking into account those different risk factors. Yeah. Yeah, that's very good. And thank you for explaining that. I mean, one of the things that I want to point out again is even though I would still say in the overall portfolio development, if you buy well-performing properties, especially if they're obviously well-performing on cash flow, but even if there's a good balance between cash flow and appreciation, I would still lean towards, if at all possible, keep it. But on the yeah. other hand, there is a very good argument, even if it weren't for the dream home, to say, okay, in certain markets, and it sounds like yours is one of those markets, where if you can almost double the value of the property in seven years, and you ask anybody who has even a little bit of credibility in real estate would say, well, that's a really, really yeah. good performing market because yeah. normally you calculate regular appreciations, maybe 5%, 6% and stuff like that, right? Mm. So if you get to 50% in seven years more, that would be great. But getting to almost 100% is amazing, right? And so that's kind of like when somebody says, okay, if I have a stock and it exploded, you know, like by 100 or 200 percent, should I still keep holding it? While in a stock, it's a little easier because with a house, you have to either keep it or sell the whole house. With stocks, yeah, exactly. you can say, OK, I bought 100 stocks and they exploded and I sell 20 percent or 30 percent just to take some of the extreme profits off the table. Right. So I would always say, OK, if you have the lucky or fortunate circumstance that you had such a strong appreciation, yeah, then basically turning and it and what you're doing i think what our audience should realize is you're basically converting that kind of equity in the same kind just in a different place probably nicer place maybe bigger place on a nicer location and stuff like that so it's not that you say okay so now i made three hundred thousand, like buy myself a lamborghini or something like yeah, that yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah. That's and I think another factor was just looking at the housing market, you know, yeah, you, over the last seven years, it is an average of 10% growth per year. Mm. And so we also thought, well, what is the likelihood that we're still going to have that for the next two to three years? Probably unlikely. I don't think the market already has in the last six months has come down significantly in the last six months. So we're probably for the next couple of years looking at either the market just flattening off or maybe coming down a little bit. In Auckland, where we are, there's an issue of undersupply. There's not enough houses as it is, which keeps the market nice and healthy. For property owners, that is, not people trying to get into the market. Yeah, obviously. Um, <laughs> but that was another factor, was just looking at, okay, it's opportunity cost. You know, yeah, right absolutely. Now, yeah. we can take that equity. We can use it to help finance our dream home. Because at the end of the day, you know, why do we invest? At the end of the day, it's to improve your lifestyle, improve your quality of life. <clears throat> and for us... Building a nice family home is something we've always wanted to do. I actually think putting that equity into the new dream home now, we're actually going to get better use of that money than if we left it in the rental, where actually, if we kept it in the rental for the next couple of years, best case scenario is we just maintain the value of that property. It might even go down. So that was another, just looking at that opportunity cost was another kind of factor in making that decision. Yeah, there's actually a somewhat of an interesting thing that you basically almost like we're playing ping pong in a sense gave me kind of like the ball back in that sense is people have lately asked me with all the things happening in the market which are very similar to what is happening in the New Zealand market what are you recommending for 
anybody who wants to continue to invest, right? In the same kind of strategy that we are advocating. And I said, the biggest change that I've made, and in a sense, I would say you're doing the same change just with a slight twist to it, is to say, we used to have a big spread between an older property that might need some renovation. In your case, you literally moved in and renovated it yourself. But even if we go with our turnkey model and we say, okay, we let a turnkey company find one, renovate it really nice and then sell it to us, fully done turnkey, that is still a 1960s, 70s, 80s property. And I don't know when your house originally was built before. I the 70s. Yeah, yeah, 70s, right? So that, I mean, if you look at that, it's sometime in the 70s, let's say it's 72, right? So just to make the calculation easy, that's a 50-year-old house. Right? Yeah. Now, even though the insides and certain things have probably been renovated over time, but fundamentally and most often structurally, it's yeah. a 50-year-old and, house. You know? And that's something else as well. We've come to realize in the process of selling it, we put a bit of work in, we've had it cleaned up nicely and had it staged, right. ready to sell. We had a building report done to provide to potential buyers. Here's a building report. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's been well looked after. We put in the brand new kitchen, brand new bathroom. But to your point, it is an old house. Ours is probably about 50 years old, maybe a little bit less. And it's getting to that point where in a few years, it may start needing some major upgrades. Yeah, you know, that's like, actually the point I wanted to get to the question that people ask me, how has your investment strategy shifted is to basically go from what we used to do predominantly buying well renovated properties to basically brand new build properties. And yeah. part of the reason is, you're basically transitioning, on the one hand, the initial value, which is kind of what you're doing with yeah. building your house as well, and you're going to have a 2022 or 2023 brand new house, which will even if you don't live in it very long, it will for the next 10 years basically be seen as a new or newer house. It will well, be recognized with more value. And if you ever want it, if anybody wanted to ever rent it from you, it will also get all these benefits of everything basically being new rather than up to 50 years or more old, right? And so yeah. <laughs> that's, that's something to consider as well. You're basically staying in the same value asset class but you're upgrading to something newer. Yeah. And that's something we will do when we buy another rental in the future. Cause I, you know, I do like um, owning rental property. We will probably build a new house, build a new rental property yeah, because right. there's really good tax incentives for doing that because of this undersupply issue that I mentioned, there are tax advantages. I mean, you need less money to get started. I think you can build with 10% deposit, which again, you would borrow anyway, but um, you can build with less down and then you get all the income is tax-free on that new property. It's funny in New Zealand here, we have had rental income is, sorry, not tax-free, I should say. It's it's tax deductible, not tax-free. Yeah. <laughs> normally, our the mortgage interest that you pay on that rental has been tax deductible. With the government that we have at the moment, they've actually changed the legislation. So they're phasing it out now. And in three or four years, we will have to, none of the interest you pay on your mortgage will be tax deductible. You'll pay the maximum amount of tax. But if we build a new property and have it as a rental, it will all be tax deductible because we've built a brand new one. So that's that's another sort of goal down the road is rotating out of that older property. We're actually losing our tax advantage and it's going to need more maintenance in a few years. So let's just get into something new, less maintenance, and we get a tax benefit. Yeah, awesome. And I think what's so beautiful about what you just described is that as an investor, especially I would say in real estate, but it's probably true in any kind of investing, you always, even though you might try to do it and should try to do it as passive as possible, it is still important to stay aware of what are the kind of different knobs that governments and tax agencies and the market and economists and the school board and yeah. you name it, the, you know, like the people who build retail stores and malls and stuff like that and roads and utilities and internet service. I can go on and on and on what's going on basically related to your portfolio and that awareness to say, okay, there's one incentive of deductibility goes away. And then on the other hand, they're coming up with a new one where we don't have to pay taxes. It's probably not a deduction. It's more just more like tax free and you yeah, can get exactly. the money yeah, and right. don't have to pay taxes mm -hmm. on yeah. it because it's a new build helping the market to grow. Yeah. So those kind of things, that awareness, I think is very important, but I want to switch a little bit since 
you're still right now from until tomorrow, I guess. <laughs> so yeah. still the owner of an investment property. You said it just barely broke even, but I'm making an uneducated guess here that you probably made a little bit of money on the cash flow and maybe had also some other opportunities. And you mentioned that you're also dabbling in Bitcoin a little bit. I have actually said, okay, we can use either Bitcoin directly or indirectly for what we call cash flow parking, um, where you buy fractional real estate that behaves the same like your property that you mentioned or our properties that we have here, and let that positive cash flow or passive income make more income. So basically multiplying the income streams. Yeah. yeah. And I'm actually looking forward to a time, to be honest, where people are going to have the option to pay the rent in Bitcoin or pay yeah. the rent in uh, New Zealand dollars or US dollars or wherever we happen to be. So you mentioned Bitcoin. So how did you get into it? And did you use it in any context with either your business or your investments? Yeah, so I got into Bitcoin in 2017, right around when it was, I think, sitting at around it was one or two thousand dollars. And then it had a big run up to about 19,000. So it's a good time to get in. <laughs> but back then I was very new, didn't buy a lot. And Bitcoin was very different back then. It, it didn't have the credibility or the proven track record that it has today. But no, I got into it. A friend of mine, good friend, who's also a business owner and investor said, look, you know, have you looked at Bitcoin? You should look at it. And he just, we had dinner one night and he just explained the technology to me and how the blockchain works. And it was just something that really interested me. But uh, now I've grown a very strong conviction in Bitcoin. I think it is the future. We're at this really exciting opportunity where Bitcoin is now being adopted and it's growing faster than the internet was. And we're basically, if you look at the growth trajectory of the internet, you know, the internet was founded in the late eighties or early nineties. Something like that. And yeah. it took, you know, even we had that dot-com bubble, you know, early two thousands back then it was still very young, but it took 10 years to even get to that point where it was still like a very new asset, very new technology rather. And we're kind of at that point with Bitcoin now. It's been around for about 10, 12 years. And it's we're at the equivalent of where the internet was in the early 2000s. And we're now expecting if the growth trajectory of Bitcoin continues, similar to how the internet and smartphones have been adopted, we will see 80 to 90% of the population of the world come onto Bitcoin in the next 10 years. And the amazing thing about Bitcoin is that it has this fixed fixed supply. This is, this is the most important thing about Bitcoin is that there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin and that will never, ever change. And so when you fix the supply, I mean, investors know supply and demand. If you fix the supply of an asset and then if we have this growth trajectory that is going to be similar or maybe even faster than that, the growth of the Internet, well, over the next 10 years, what do you expect to happen to the price if you've got this fixed supply? So I really see it as this amazing opportunity to, I mean, people come to Bitcoin for the price and to buy it, to invest and to make money, obviously, but you stay for the revolution. Bitcoin is a digital financial revolution. It's about taking the power back from the banks and from governments who, as we've seen over COVID, have been irresponsible with our money. They just print as much money as they need. Yeah, right. and that, that actually reduces our purchasing power. Yep. All this inflation that we're seeing right now is actually taking away our purchasing power. And so how I use it in my business is I, you know, I make a profit every month. I keep some cash in my business to cover my running expenses and you know, pay my team and my contractors and pay my tax. I take all of that to one side. I've then just been putting part of that profit into Bitcoin. You know, I don't want to spend all of that. You know, we're using it to finance our house, of course, but I'm pretty frugal. I'm not going to go and buy a Lamborghini. I don't need a flash car or lots of fancy toys and things. So I'm happy keeping that retained profit. But I rather than leaving it in the bank, I mean, the bank, as we're on an investors podcast, I'm sure most of your audience you know, know that not to leave the money in the bank, because with the interest rates that we're getting, you're not even keeping up with inflation. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's why I mentioned just briefly cash flow parking and fractional real estate, because I mean, for one, we know as ideal investors in our system that real estate is at least a significant component. I mentioned before we started recording, you know, like we basically say in the big picture, not financial advice here, but in big picture, 70% real estate, 30% other assets. Yeah. Right. And we really mean that now there is always a little bit of cash because every so often, I mean, when you get paid probably on an invoice, you initially get cash or currency and then you have yep. to decide what you do with it. So there's always a little bit. But other than that, what we're saying is 70, 30. Now, 
what I'm curious about when we're talking about that, and that would be one way to, you know, you're basically parking, yep. in a sense, your profits or parts of your profits in Bitcoin. Yep. And I'm really curious because I'm relatively new aficionado, I would say, and I'm still learning a lot. When somebody says, Paul, do you look at it as an investment or are you looking at it as money? And if either one, why? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess it depends how you define money. Okay. You know, if money is a medium of exchange, which it is, a medium of exchange is we like when you pay for my consulting services, you give me money, I give you services back. Right. I have never, ever, ever used Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. I've never paid for anything. Okay. Oh, I've bought one thing with Bitcoin, but I don't use it day to, day to transact. You were the guy with the proverbial pizza, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't use it as a medium of exchange. Right now, I don't want to because I think it's still very undervalued right now. I Number one is I don't want to part with my Bitcoin. My goal is to every single month have more Bitcoin than I did at the start of the month. So I don't want to use it as a medium of exchange. But I do think when it becomes a mature asset, when it's we're at less than I think it's half a billion dollars of market cap right now, gold by comparison is a ten trillion dollar asset, you know, and Bitcoin is very superior to gold in that it's digital. It's gold that you could teleport around the world because it's digital. So I think we will at least surpass the value of gold, and that puts Bitcoin at a five hundred thousand dollar valuation. But you know, we've if more people use it as a medium of exchange, if it starts to take market cap away from other assets, whether it be property bonds, treasuries, it could easily be a $1 million asset per coin in the next 10 years or so. So I don't want to use it as a medium of exchange right now, but I think it will get there when it becomes a more mature asset. Um, so right now, my main use of it as is as a store of value. I'm just looking at, look, here's the profit in my business. I don't need this right now. So I'm using it, to... sorry for interrupting, but you kind of using it like gold, right? Like gold, it's digital gold. Yeah, it's somewhere to put my retained earnings that's not in the bank. And it's more liquid than property. I totally agree with all of it. I have not been able, also I have to admit that I haven't really tried, but I have not been able to really pay anything with Bitcoin. So I'm treating it like gold as well. Yeah. With fundamentally the there. same reason. I mean, one of the things that you probably are very aware of that I think our audience would probably be interested in, when you look at... And I just wrote this literally in the last blog post that's going to come out next Tuesday. If you look at currency, and I don't know the exact numbers for the New Zealand dollar, but I know for the US dollar, most people would say the version of the US dollar that we're using right now is basically the one that was created and in, in circulation and so forth when the Federal Reserve was created in 1913. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's been around for more than 100 years, which is actually in comparison to most other currencies in the world in history is actually a pretty long period of time to yeah. still be around, be the reserve currency. But when you do the purchasing power comparison, then you can say it is very obvious. It's not even something I'm saying, but like the Federal Reserve itself and economists and statistics experts and stuff, everybody says the loss of purchasing power between 1913 and now is anywhere between 96 and 99%. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and so when you're that and reason, like you mentioned, Paul, you said that beautifully is because, you know, we started with a relative limited amount of dollars and we now have trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. Well, you it's because we came off the gold standard in 1971. You know? Right, yeah, right. But I mean, the point is something that is so inflated in just the amount of dollars available that makes every single existing dollar obviously less valuable. Yeah. And I think it's important when you say, mm -hmm. okay, people oftentimes debate, why do you call Bitcoin digital gold? Or what's the similarity to gold is that Bitcoin is literally deflationary. Mm. Even though, even if you say 2141 is when the last Bitcoin will be issued, Right, so we're all probably going to become dust by then. But anyway, that's the official, you know, when you go with the mining and everything, when the 21 million are full. But there are also a few lost over time because people lose yeah, their people wallet, lose wallet keys, yeah. or they lost their passwords and stuff like that. But that limit, even if nobody ever lost anything, is inherently 
deflationary. And if you compare it to gold, in my studies, I found gold's volume is increasing somewhere between 1.5 and 2.5% per year, which yeah. makes it so stable. Now it takes something that doesn't increase in even less than gold, right? So that, from my perspective, is a deflationary versus anything that most people that are currently alive have ever seen is only yeah. inflationary currency. And so, you know, if you do that comparison, you know, something like the US dollar, that keeps losing value while you have something that just mathematically, you don't even need to be a, an expert if you just don't have mm -hmm. more of it. And the other thing gets more and more and more then the ratio always has to go in favor of the one that remains. I think, it was, I think it was Michael Saylor who said that if you take any other asset in the world and you increase the demand for that asset, that's going to push the price up, of course, because if there's more demand for something, price goes up. And what's going to happen when the price goes up? is the supply will increase because now there's more of an incentive to produce that asset. So gold is a really good example. Gold is very stable in price at the moment, which makes it a good store of value. But if the price of gold suddenly shot up, if, if it became very valuable, the inflation rate of gold would probably not be one to 2%. You'd actually have more gold miners. People would invest in gold mines. We'd open more mines. And actually the inflation rate of gold would probably go three, four, 5% because now gold is worth so much. We should just mine more of it because it's, valuable yeah that's true and that's a little bit of a proof of work too because the more you try to mine the harder it gets right and so well that's where and we're getting into this technical but we can't say the same for bitcoin because if the price goes up which we saw last year or at the start of covid it, it crashed down to three and a half thousand and in six months i can't remember the time frame it went to sixty five thousand dollars you know massive appreciation in price but that had zero impact on the inflation rate of bitcoin even if more miners come online if you even if you double the amount of miners, the great thing about how Bitcoin is mined is there's this difficulty adjustment. Yeah, but I mean, if you really go to the extreme, right, I think there's an analogy between price inflation in gold and price inflation in Bitcoin, because if people who mine, typically miners have Bitcoin too, right? So yes, if the price it, yeah. goes from, let's say, currently 21,000 to 70,000, just for the sake of argument, and that would double the number of miners it would accelerate a little bit to get to the next halving because you just, you know, if you mine more and more and more, you, the difficulty doesn't get different between halvings. But it, as far as I know, in my research, it doesn't get no, more the, difficult the more people are mining. You know. The difficulty adjustment is calculated every two weeks. So right. what we saw last year, I think it was, China banned Bitcoin in China. Or my, sorry, mining, mining Bitcoin was banned yeah, in China. Yeah, yeah. And I think we saw about 50% of the miners on the Bitcoin network were shut off immediately right, because right. now it's illegal in China. They've actually all relocated to other jurisdictions, the US, the Middle East. But when that happened, we lost a lot of mining power. And then two weeks later, the difficulty adjustment is recalculated. It looks at all of the miners on the network and it recalculates the difficulty adjustment. So the network will self-correct itself and it goes, okay, we've lost half the miners. So we're going to make it half as difficult or twice as easy to mine Bitcoin. And that's what keeps the inflation rate of Bitcoin the same. So even Bitcoins, uh, we could go down to a couple of miners now, we would still mine the same number of Bitcoin as we do today. So the difficulty adjustment is actually calculated roughly every two weeks. The halving is the how much Bitcoin you are rewarded with when you solve the Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I got that wrong. Thank yeah. you for correcting me on that. Yeah, I, the last part I got with the halving about the amount a miner gets basically for a successful solution, so to speak. Yeah. But yeah, I didn't does, know that, that adjustment every, every two weeks. Years, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's very cool. So that just even helps the picture because no gold mine is going to dig anything out in two weeks. But that's anyway. why, <laughs> going back to my gold example. So if Bitcoin this year, we're at 21,000 right now, if it goes to $100,000 by the end of the year, it will have no impact on the inflation rate of Bitcoin. The same, even if the number of miners doubles on the network, the difficulty will adjust and we will still mine the same Bitcoin in December as we do today. Until we get to the next halving, which I think is in 2024, then the inflation rate of Bitcoin will cut in half. So I, I can't remember, is it 12 and a half or six and a half Bitcoin per block at the moment? Yeah, I don't know. I just know that currently the inflation for Bitcoin is almost equal to the current inflation of gold. But when we get to right. the last halving, it's obviously yeah. going to half. So if you say gold is about 2%, then Bitcoin will be right around 1% where yeah. it is about 2 now. And then the next four years later, 
it will be almost ridiculous. <laughs> even, this is what makes it that, such, right? a good, um, uh, such an attractive asset is because we have this fixed supply, regardless of what the network does. If China makes it illegal, fine, we don't care. You can kick miners off, you can add miners onto the network. None of that will impact how much Bitcoin is actually mined. And uh, so the, the inflation rate is fixed. And we have this increasing demand that's matching the adoption rate of the internet. You probably read and hear, especially since you're obviously quite passionate about it, and I'm getting more and more excited about it as well. I mean, but there's obviously, especially when volatility is high, there is a lot of skepticism. And I'm kind of wondering when you encounter either through media or otherwise, the skepticism and some of the arguments, can you share a few things that you tell people um, that basically try to use at least the most common arguments why people should stay away from it or not do it or yeah there's lots of reasons people use to try and discredit bitcoin one of the most popular arguments people use against bitcoin at the moment is the energy usage mm -hmm. um, people say that bitcoin consumes a lot of energy and first thing we need to understand and this is what Saifedean we talked about before we started recording Saifedean Amos talks about in his book I think he talks about it in the Bitcoin Standard I actually haven't read his book but I've heard him talk about it a lot on podcasts is first thing you need to understand is that using energy is not a bad thing <laughs> you know just because something uses energy in fact our quality of existence our lifestyle is dependent on using lots of energy Take, for example, if you want to go on holiday, let's use me in New Zealand. If I want to go to Australia, I can use a kayak and I can kayak across the Tasman Sea and I'm probably going to die. <laughs> <laughs> But I choose. So I, I could do that because it uses less energy yeah. or I could fly in a plane and that uses a lot of energy. So and even our dishwashers, you know, dishwashers consume more energy than the Bitcoin network. But nobody has an issue with dishwashers or Christmas lights. <laughs> because we get value from those things. So that's the first thing people need to just acknowledge is that using energy is not bad. And in the case of Bitcoin, the energy that it uses is a good thing because it actually protects Bitcoin. And again, this is getting into the quite a technical area. If you're new to Bitcoin, I'll do my best to keep it simple. But the whole value proposition of Bitcoin is, is that it is decentralized money that governments and individuals and groups cannot change. It's a decentralized technology. And how it maintains that decentralization is through the mining and also the nodes that run the Bitcoin network. Mining consumes a lot of energy. And that actually protects Bitcoin because theoretically, if a country or even a group of countries decided, let's stop Bitcoin, we don't like it, let's stop it. The first thing it would require is them to invest billions of dollars in mining equipment and hardware, which is in very short supply right now because we have chip shortage shortages. But even if you could invest in all the computing power that you need, you would then need to expend a massive amount of physical energy. You'd need to be um, running nuclear power plants, you know, just dedicated to powering your Bitcoin mining rigs to even an attempt an attack on Bitcoin. It would be extremely expensive. It would require astronomical amounts of energy to try and attack the Bitcoin network. So the energy that it uses protects Bitcoin because it means it stays decentralized. It means that it protects all of our wealth and money in a way that governments cannot influence. So just like we saw with COVID, they print all this money, they inflate our money, we lose our purchasing power. By keeping your value in Bitcoin, you're putting your wealth into an asset that cannot be influenced by other people. And so the that's kind of my response to people that criticize the energy that it uses is that the, the energy that it uses is a good thing. One more yeah, point yeah. actually is that the Bitcoin miners, this is the most interesting thing I think, is that the miners of Bitcoin, in order to produce a profit, they are looking for the cheapest source of energy possible. Right. And so that often comes from wasted energy, whether it's like flared gas from, from natural gas and oil fields, they use flared gas, which is just wasted energy, or hydropower that's just, you know, if, if, if there's too much water stored up, they just let the water go. So they often look for sources of wasted energy, even methane. Often there are Bitcoin miners now that are capturing methane from landfills and burning that to produce CO2, which is actually better than letting methane go into the atmosphere because methane is about 10 times more potent than CO2. And by burning that methane, you can power Bitcoin. And so there's all these innovative ways that people are finding cheaper sources of wasted power. And that's the amazing thing about Bitcoin is you are incentivized to use the cheapest form of power possible. And that makes energy production more efficient. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would totally agree with that point. There's maybe an additional supplemental point is that 
the argument that has been raised a few years ago about kind of like using large amounts of dirty power or dirty power generation, as far as I know, especially with the transition of a lot of miners from China and Asia over to the United States, especially to Texas, has created massive renewable energy power yeah. generation with yeah. wind and solar and so forth. And the percentage, I think, is now up to 60% of the, you know, if you don't have access to any kind of what you call waste leftover power, and you just basically generate it purely for the purpose, even then 60% is renewable energy, which is probably a good side effect, so to speak. The thing that I always point out when people bring up this energy requirement to, to generate Bitcoin is that that almost always sounds like we have one thing that needs a lot of energy and another thing that needs no energy when the truth couldn't be more different. Because when you look at everything involved to keep, let's for example, the US dollar economy from a pure currency and financial institutions perspective running, and the amount of power that that uses, it may, I would venture to say it's probably similar. But even if it is slightly less, it's definitely not that one thing uses no power and the other uses enormous amounts of power. It's yes, both use power and they might not be on parity. But on the other hand, you know, we only need to use power for Bitcoin for a limited amount of time. And I have yeah. not heard that anybody has said, OK, in 2041, we're going to be done with the dollar or the Australian no, yeah. or the New Zealand dollar or any other currency. So for as long as people have had a means of exchange, they had to use and have used some power. And the more sophisticated the means of exchange have become, the more power they needed to use and the more people and jobs and what have you to basically distribute and make that available and all these kind of things. So one thing in the coming and bringing it back to our real estate investing and what the show's main main aspect is, if you had to advise somebody, I mean, you said you how you're doing it for yourself, but if you had advi to advise somebody who still up till tomorrow has a rental property, yeah. would you recommend to put all or some of the positive cash flow in bitcoin or how would you split it up i wouldn't yeah i wouldn't do everything unless you have a good appetite for risk because it is a volatile asset but i think at this point you should have at least a small allocation to bitcoin even if it's just five percent of your portfolio or even you could start with less because i think the risk reward trade-off is looking really good like it is this still very young asset that has massive potential ahead of it. So even if you allocate just 5% of your portfolio to Bitcoin, it could well become the best performing part of your portfolio in the next 10 years. Yeah, and that's actually, and we are obviously like always, I guess, for very aligned because one of the things that I like to remind people is when we apply our strategy to be on the journey towards what we call the time freedom point where we have enough passive income to cover our life expenses, then we all know, especially when we're in the early stages, that we're looking at 8, 10, 12 years. And if we're willing to say, OK, I'm committing to an investment approach that has that time horizon for the first phase to get to the time freedom point, it doesn't mean that we can't invest further beyond that anymore, but then we don't at least have the requirement to work anymore. So with that in mind, we are accepting 8, 10, 12 years. Well, if you accept that for something like Bitcoin, even in small quantities and treat it like gold, it is very, yeah. very likely just by pure fundamental math that in 10 years, it's probably 10 times as valuable, I should say. Yeah. yeah, I encourage everyone to just learn a bit about it, you know, listen to podcasts or read books about it, just learn about it. And I think the more you learn, the more interesting it becomes. And it's a really easy asset to just, Bitcoin only requires that you be patient. You just have to buy it and hold it. And you, you're going to have to weather some storms and some volatile times. But if you hold Bitcoin for a minimum of four years, anyone that's held Bitcoin for a minimum of four years has never lost money. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I have to bring it back to what your main thing is that you're doing and say, what's the most efficient way to invest in Bitcoin? The most efficient way in terms of buying it, you mean? <clears throat> buying it, How holding it. Yeah, what would you say? I mean, you're the efficiency expert, right? So well, I <laughs> oh, well uh, I, I do I do what's called dollar cost averaging. So I set up an automatic payment. You'll have I use a New Zealand exchange to do it because I'm sending in New Zealand dollars, but in the US, like Coinbase and Gemini, you know, one of the popular exchanges, yeah. I send an automatic payment to my Bitcoin wallet every week. And that way I don't worry about the price. I just want to buy a little bit every week and I dollar cost average my way in. So some weeks I'm getting a good price right now. Or right now I'm getting a very good price. 
some weeks not as good price, but that's okay because you're just averaging in over the long run. And if you are in it for 10 years and we, if Bitcoin's value proposition plays out and we we reach that point where it's, you know, 10 times more than it is today, you're not going to worry too much whether you bought it at 20,000 or 40,000 or 60,000. Um, so that's what I find is best. Just set and forget an automatic payment every week. Yeah. And in a sense, we are recommending the same thing. We call that cash flow parking. I mean, you not necessarily always have the exact same nominal amount, but just to park the money that is left over from your rental income after paying all expenses, same thing. So we are aligned there. So last question before we close, Paul, I always ask that every guest and it's kind of unrelated to the theme of the podcast. And that is, if you had a time machine, where would you go and why? And you would come back, obviously, you're just not allowed to change the space-time continuum. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> I would probably go into the future to find out what the Bitcoin price chart looks like to find the best <laughs> times to buy Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why? And probably see how many investment properties you have by then, right? <laughs> All right, cool. Well, when people are fascinated by your knowledge about Bitcoin and efficiencies and all those kind of things, Paul, how can they get a hold of you? How can they get in touch? Yeah, the best place to learn about me is my website, paulminers.com. That's M-I-N-O-R-S.com. And uh, yeah, we didn't talk much about what I do today, but that's fine. Um, I really enjoyed the chat. But uh, there, that's where the, where you can learn more about me and, and what I'm up to. Yeah, I hope I mentioned often enough that you are an efficiency expert. So if yeah. somebody wants to get more efficient with their investments, their life, their business and so forth, then definitely yeah. reach out to Paul. All right, Paul. Well, thank you for being on the show and spending your time. I know it went a little longer than I promised in the beginning, but it was a really interesting conversation. Yeah, so I'm maybe happy to... Happy to come on again anytime. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe when Bitcoin is at 50,000 or something. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, thank you and have a good time. Talk to you soon again. Thanks, Axel. Thank you. Thanks for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Ideal Investor Show. More info and the links we mentioned during the show are in the show notes, or you can go to our website at idealwealthgrower.com and sign up for the Apple Podcast link. And if you like to talk to me, sign up for a strategy call. Hopefully you want to share what you learned with your network and bring more people in. We are really eager to hear your comments. And until next time, be well, stay safe and ciao.